<coughs> Excuse me. Well, this evening, <coughs> I just want to read, um, I think it's four verses from Romans chapter 5 to remind us of the, uh, what, what is central in the Lord's love and mercy towards us. And, of course, that is the giving of His Son. And that's really the one through whom all the blessings that God has for us come through. As a matter of fact, every good thing that everyone in the world has to enjoy comes from the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world and He died on the cross. Uh, even those who, who will never actually be saved by that. Uh, the Lord preserves the world. Uh, every good gift that is given from the Lord comes through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and particularly the blessings of salvation that we enjoy through faith in His name, salvation from hell, provision in this life, and of course the heaven uh, that we are looking forward to and the new heavens and the new earth. So this passage really has to do with the love of God expressed in that act of giving us His Son while we were still His enemies. So this is what Paul writes to the church at Rome in chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. He says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Now, there's a lot in this passage, but again, what I want us to be reminded of is while we were His enemies, while we were sinners, still in rebellion against God, God shows us His great love by sending His Son into the world to live and to die for us so that we might come to know Him. Now, this morning, remember, we were looking at God's perfections. We were looking at His glory, the glory that He reveals in the creation, but especially that which He reveals in His Word, those things that make Him beautiful to us, those things that make Him desirable to us, things that the devil wants us to forget, not see. He clouds them. He tries to draw our eyes away from them so that we won't see them and our hearts won't go out to Him so that we won't love Him as we should and we won't devote ourselves to Him in the way that we should. Now, again, quickly, the things that we saw is His, uh, what we call His natural attributes, His metaphysical perfections, how great He is. Remember the, the hymn, How Great Thou Art. Well, He is great. He is the greatest conceivable being. He is the one who is really without limit in, in every respect. With regard to time, He is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. With regard to presence, He is everywhere in His fullness, in his, with His full being. At every point in space, in His power, there is nothing that the Lord cannot do. He can do all that He wants to do. He's limitless in His knowledge. He knows everything that uh, has been, everything that will be, everything that could be. And, of course, He's infinite or limitless in His wisdom. He knows how to take that knowledge and how to use it in a way that will bring glory to Him as well as work everything together for our good. We saw that God also does not need anything uh, to sustain Him. He, he, the reason for His existence is, is in Himself. He is self-sustaining. He also doesn't need anything to make Him happy. He is absolutely perfectly happy. Uh, nothing can possibly increase his happiness or diminish it. And we saw that he never changes. He is a perfect being. But we, perfect, we also particularly noted that these things would not necessarily make him beautiful in and of themselves unless they were adorned with holiness. Remember, if he were evil, then all these characteristics, all these attributes would make him terrifying. It would make him the greatest conceivable monster, but being adorned with holiness, he is the greatest conceivable being. He is also beautiful. Now, holiness is what makes him to be glorious. It's what makes him to be beautiful. It's what makes him to be beautiful to us, and at the same time, what makes him to be not beautiful to those who do not know him. This is what Edward Reynolds, uh, one of the Westminster divines uh, who was at the Westminster Assembly that 
uh, put together the, what we call the Westminster Confession of Faith, a great uh, minister, a great teacher in the church had to say regarding the beauty of God. He says, God had revealed his holiness to Israel, and he wished them to consider it the beauty of his nature. If we take a portrait of a man, we try to represent his face, not his hand, nor his back, nor his foot. We try to delineate his beauty, to refresh our minds with that which is most memorable and distinguishing in his exterior resemblance. So, while the hand and finger of God denote his power and skill, and his throne is used for majesty and dominion, he considers his holiness as the true luster of his character, as that by which he will be best known. And again, as I mentioned before, Edwards gives us the reason why that is, because that is what makes him truly good. Now, holiness, as we know, is um, really the absence of sin. It is the love of everything good, the hatred of everything evil. It is expressed in many different ways in God's righteousness, which is his love for the right, his justice, his determination to reward what is good and to punish what is evil. But it, holiness or love can also be expressed in other ways. And tonight we want to consider something else that makes, you know, another expression of God's love that makes him to be beautiful. It's what we usually think of when we think about God and why he's beautiful to us. And that is because of his mercy and his grace towards us. And of course, these are together more other powerful motives uh, to get us to love and to devote ourselves to Him. Every Lord's Day morning, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We remember the grace and the mercy of God in sending His Son, and that stirs our hearts up to love Him more. Now, this is something the devil does not want us to remember. He wants us to forget it. He wants us to put it out of our minds, because when it's out of our minds, we're not going to be drawn to the Lord as we should. We're not going to be serving the Lord as we should. So tonight we're going to look at what it is that the Lord has done, but that's a very big subject. So we're going to look at each of these points briefly and just get the big picture. So first of all, what I want us to think about is his love towards us in the past. Now, the Bible tells us that... Um, in eternity is really, the one thing that's interesting about the love of God towards us, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, is that this is something that has always been in his heart. There was not a time when God started to love us. He has loved us from eternity with an everlasting love. And we read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6 where it says this, Paul writes this to the Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, before he made anything, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Now, I know Paul packed a lot of stuff into those couple of verses. He also says in Romans chapter 8, those whom he foreknew, which we understand to mean foreloved, he predestined. And that's what we're reading about here, God's foreloving us and predetermining uh, us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, think about this. Out of all of fallen mankind, Paul tells us God chose to have mercy on us, to send Jesus for us in order that he might adopt us as his children. Now, if we had this passage in front of us, we could notice a couple of different things here. It's not because we chose Jesus. That's not the reason why he chose us, because the Bible tells us quite plainly, none of us would have chosen him apart from his grace. Paul writes in Romans 8.8, 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, and that is how we come into this world, not in the spirit, 
but in the flesh. Jesus also says in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. So in and of ourselves, we could not have chosen Jesus. God had first to choose us. And so the choice was his. And he chose, according to this passage, to send his son so that his son might send his spirit in order to give us the ability to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive his righteousness, to become holy so that God could receive us into his family. It was God's intention to make us children, which is why he sent his son into the world so that we could become holy, so that we could be his children. And again, why did he do this? Well, according to what Paul writes in Ephesians, he gives several reasons, and none of them have to do with us, except we get the benefits of it. But the reason why he did this was purely out of his love, out of his grace, the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which means that his glory might be revealed so that we would praise him for that. He wanted to reveal how loving he really is, so he did this. Now, we saw this morning that he did this even knowing ahead of time who we would be, that we wouldn't be perfect, that we would be sinners, uh, and all the sins that we would commit from the time we came into the world to the time he saved us, and even after he saved us to the time that we died. He knew all of these things, and yet he still loved us. He still chose us. And that also tells us that, again, nothing's going to catch God by surprise. We're not going to surprise him and, and commit some sin that is going to cause him to, to boot us away. He loved us from eternity, and he will love us all the way to the end, which means forever. Uh, there was, um, as you know, um, one of our elders, uh, Dick Nielsen, who has gone to be with the Lord, used to uh, pray inevitably. It seemed like every time we prayed before the service, he would always pray this prayer, Lord, we thank you that your love for us will never end because it never had a beginning. It always has been. It always will be. Uh, and that is true. That's, by the way, security for us. If we love the Lord, it means He loves us, and it means that He will always love us. It means we will be with Him. Now, when it was, of course, His time, He made us. He created us. He brought us into existence. He brought us into the world. And he gave us a special blessing that sets us apart from the other creatures that he made, except, of course, for the angels. And that is we were given the privilege of being made in the image of God. We were made like him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says man is the image of God. Now, we're not the image of God in our you know, physical shape, but in the various spiritual attributes that we have, characteristics, abilities that we have, the ability to think the ability to choose, to purpose, to do things, make plans and carry them out, to make choices, to make morally significant choices. God made us like Him in His image so that we could reflect His character and His nature, and that's exactly what we did originally when we were in the garden in our innocency. Of course, Adam and Eve were the only two that actually qualify for that. So he made us in his image, and that is a special blessing for which we ought to be thankful. After he brought us into the world, he took care of us. For most of us, it was through our parents, the parents that bore us. We know that some parents are better than others at doing this. Some of us had Christian parents who actually taught us the Bible, who raised us with the truth. Now, that can be, that can be good and bad. It's, it's always good because... You know, it, it, to be raised in the light rather than the darkness is a great blessing. But the downside of it is we can take it for granted. That's something we should never do. And usually, well, of course, if we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the children come to faith, they see what a great blessing it was to be raised with the Bible. So it always is a great blessing. Um, it's just that, again, taking it, sometimes we can take it for granted. Um, those of us who may not have had that privilege uh, we learn, uh, we, we come to Christ through somebody else, and then we have to kind of uh, fight to learn these things. We tend to appreciate them more when we have to fight for them rather than when they're just sort of handed to us. And I think that works in just about uh, every area. None of our parents were perfect, but all of us who were here this evening, all of us had what we needed 
We did. We're still here, right? We, need, we have what we needed to survive. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So God was good to us. God has taken care of us. And most importantly, of course, in his time, he saved us. He sent, of course, his son into the world. The son sent his spirit. He changed our sinful hearts, opened our blind eyes, shows us the, the glory, his glory in his son, and he drew us to him. Um, we might say, use the term irresistibly, um, although because of our sin there is some resistance, but he showed us his beauty, and that drew us out to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, again, we look at him the way we do, desirable, lovely, beautiful, the greatest conceivable being, the one that we're willing to give our lives to, where people like Richard Dawkins think he's the the most obnoxious character that anybody ever devised and anybody ever wrote about. He's purely fictional, and as we were reminded this morning, he wrote a number of nasty things about God. Why does he look at the same God and find him to be so distasteful? But we look at him and find him to be so beautiful. It's because of that change of heart that the Lord has given to us. Now, that salvation, that, we really can't, I think, appreciate what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us unless we understand two things what hell is like and what heaven is like. Now, at this particular juncture, we need to understand that the Lord has saved us from hell. Hell is what we deserved, okay? It's easy to say, it's really difficult to understand what that really means. Now, we only have just a moment, but I want us to think about a couple of things regarding hell. Hell is real. You know, just about every cult, I think we talked about this before, they make additions and subtractions from the Word of God. And one thing that they inevitably re uh, remove is hell because they don't want to believe in a God who would send anybody to hell. But that is, a matter of fact, what the Bible says is going to happen if they don't repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to have to suffer for their sins forever. And that is where we were when we came into the world. We were in that state. We were guilty. We we're on our way to this fire. Now, hell is real. Hell is the eternal fire. Jesus talks about it in uh, the uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew 25 when he's talking about the sheep and goat judgment. When he says to the goats who are on his, on his left, depart from me, you wicked ones, into the eternal fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not a pleasant place. The Puritan Thomas Watson writes this one sentence about hell. He says, the scripture tells us that in hell there are these three things. There is darkness, there is fire, and there are chains. Miserable place. And again, representing it in terms that are physical, but these are really more spiritual in nature, but like this, darkness, chains, fire. Now, that's where we were headed. That's what we deserve because of what Adam did. That sin was imputed to us because of all the sins that we had committed, because of the hatred that was in our heart. We had the heart of a Richard Dawkins when we came into this world, hating God. So this is what we deserve. And we would have been punished there according to our sins. The Bible teaches that there are degrees of punishment in hell. Jesus talks about on one occasion, I think it's in Luke chapter 12, where he says, that servant who knew his master's will, but didn't get ready, didn't do what he was supposed to do, but committed deeds worthy of a flogging, will receive many blows. But the servant who didn't know his will, but still did deeds worthy of a flogging, will receive but few. And we also saw this morning how Jesus was rebuking the, the cities in which he had performed most of his miracles. And he said it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and for Sodom in the day of judgment than for, for you cities because I performed most of my miracles in you. I taught in your streets. You had much more light than they did. So more tolerable in the day of judgment, less tolerable degrees of punishment, more blows, less blows. So we would have been judged according to the sins that we had committed, every action, every sinful action, every sinful thought, every sinful desire. Jesus says even every idle word that we've spoken would be brought up against us in the day of judgment. And we would then be cast into hell 
uh, an appropriate degree of punishment. And that punishment would have gone on forever. Thomas Brooks writes this. He says, the damned shall live as long in hell as God himself shall live in heaven. Remember, hell is where God punishes the wicked. And as long as God exists, that punishment is going to be ongoing because those sins have been committed against an infinitely worthy and holy God. Now, one of the um, New England Puritans uh, conjectured, and I think Jonathan Edwards might have agreed with him, that because sin continues in hell, that the lake of fire on, at the day of judgment is where the, you know, the, the deeds the, the are going to be weighed and, and punishment meted. But once they're in the lake of fire, the sin doesn't stop. The sin continues. There's still the evil thoughts, the evil desires, even though there may not necessarily be evil actions. There's blasphemy. People are going to be doing things in hell that deserve greater punishment. So Joseph Bellamy believed that really the lake of fire might be more like a whirlpool that's swirling and people in it are going down further and further to greater levels of punishment. And that certainly is possible. But even if it weren't possible, the fact that it goes on forever would have a similar effect. Thomas Watson writes this, thus it is in hell, they would die, but they cannot. The wicked shall, always, shall be always dying, but never dead. The smoke of the furnace ascends forever and ever. Oh, who can endure thus to be ever upon the rack? This word ever breaks the heart. Wicked men now think the Sabbaths long and think a prayer long. But oh, how long will it be to lie in hell forever and ever? Now, Satan wants us to forget that that is what would have happened to each one of us if not for God's mercy and grace. This is what God has saved us from. And remember what it cost God actually to save us from this. Jesus came into this world and took our punishment on himself and endured hell on the cross for us. That's where the wrath of God was poured out upon him because our sins were laid on him and he died in our place. Now, we don't want to forget our obligation to God. We don't want to forget what we owe to him for this. And what do we owe to him? Well, we owe to him everything. We, we owe him our lives. He saved our lives. He saved our souls. We owe him all the love and devotion that we can possibly give him, which, of course, is the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, Satan also wants us to forget about hell for another reason. It's because there are still a number of people who are in danger of hell. Now, how often do we see people like this all around us? Even people who are in our family and friends who don't know Jesus and don't even think about the fact that they're going to suffer these very things if they don't repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan tries to distract us here as well so that we don't think about it. He, he tries to get us to be more concerned about our personal relationships here on, on earth rather than you know, being a true friend of this individual by sharing the truth with them. Uh, he tries to convince us that, that we won't convince them, that they're not going to see it, that they're, th they're going to think we're crazy and we're not going to get anywhere with them. Uh, but we need to remember that if he convinced us when we didn't believe that he can convince others. That's something that God does. It's not something we do. You know, we just tell them the truth, and God convinces them uh, by his Holy Spirit. One of the reasons why the Lord saved us was so that we would tell them how they can be saved. So we need to be thinking about that. It's the great commission that the Lord has given to the church. How are we involved in this? Um, Keith Green has a song where he talks about, you know, um, there's so little I can do. I, there's, I have you know, so few gifts. And he was actually somebody who was tremendously gifted. Uh, he says, but there is something that I can do, and there's something that we can do, and that is we may not be able to save the world, but we might be able to save one, right? We can, there are certain things we can do. So the fact that we can't do everything doesn't mean that we don't do anything. We do what we can do by the grace of God. That's what we owe to him for the mercy he's shown us 
that's what we owe to our neighbor, the debt that we owe, the debt of love. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, that, that is what God has already done for us in the past. Uh, secondly, we need to think about his love in, in the present. You know, what is it that God is doing for us right now? Because Satan wants us to forget those things as well. Well, he preserves our lives, our physical lives. He provides for us day by day. Everything that we have comes from the Lord. What we need to sustain us, all our food, clothing, our shelter. Why do we thank the Lord for each meal that, that comes, that he gives to us? Uh, it's because we're recognizing that he is the one who has given it to us. When I was growing up, my mother would always tell me if I left some food on the plate, you know, out of all the starving children in the world, and of course my thought was, well, how would my eating this help them? But the point is that we have this food and we need to be thankful and not ungrateful because there are many people who don't have these things. And why do we have these things? Well, it's because of God's mercy and his grace. We're actually still enjoying the blessings of having a Christian nation. Uh, this nation was founded on Christian principles. We're still enjoying the blessings of that, whereas nations that are basically bound up in idolatry and animism, that are worshiping false gods or worshiping trees and rocks and things like this, there's consequences for that. And, and one of the consequences is famine. And that's one of the reasons why the situation is that, that they're in. But again, the point for us is that God is being good to us and he's taking care of us. James tells us in James 1, 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God provides for us in the present. He provides for us physically, but he also provides for us spiritually. He's given to us the Holy Spirit. Remember how Jesus said, it's important for you that I leave because if I don't leave, the Comforter will not come. And he has sent the Comforter to guide us, to counsel us, to help us. Jesus says in John 14, verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So he's blessing us by giving to us his Holy Spirit continuously. Uh, the Lord is protecting us from physical and spiritual dangers all around us. As we read this morning in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Well, the fact is he's protecting us from all dangers. So we don't have to be afraid of any. And, of course, the Lord has given to us promises that we can, to put it perhaps crassly, cash in on whenever we want. We can ask for the things that we need, and he will give them to us. Jesus says in John 16, verse 24, Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. Now, this isn't a blanket promise that he's going to give us, you know, the Cadillac, the Maserati, the Ferrari, uh, whatever our hearts may desire. But if our hearts belong to him and we delight in him and we want to see his kingdom move forward and we ask for those things we need, God will give them to us. That was one of the reasons why God answered George Mueller's prayers or Mueller's so, so um, completely and so often is because he had devoted himself to doing the Lord's work and the things that he was asking for or the things he needed to do it, and God always supplied in, in just tremendous ways. So the Lord has saved us, and in a very real sense, He is saving us, He is preserving us in every way until we arrive at heaven. Now, Satan wants us to think that all these things, these provisions, protections, and so forth, really are coming from us or from man and not from Him. But they all come from him. Even the fact we have a police force is because of God's mercy and grace. We need to be thankful for that. Now, there are things that we need to do to provide for ourselves. God did not make a promise to us that he's going to put food on the table. If we don't work, we do need to work. And we do need to make sure that we are, you know, keeping ourselves safe in safe areas and watching out for certain things. But these efforts that we're putting into these things would not be fruitful at all without the blessing that God gives. It still is coming.
from Him. So we need to recognize that and love Him for that and thank Him for that and show Him that thankfulness by serving Him, okay? So God has blessed us tremendously in the past. He's blessing us tremendously in the present. Finally, He is going to bless us tremendously in the future. His love is going to be poured out on us forever. So let's think about what He's going to do for us in the future. I think Satan hides this most of all because it's the most glorious thing that the Lord has in store for us. The Bible says that God is going to keep us safe until death uh, and that after death, even before death, but certainly after death, nothing will separate us from Him. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing's going to take us away from His bringing us safely to heaven. We know He's going to bring us there. And there's not going to be this, you know, lapse of time between the time we die and the time we go to heaven. For some reason, this is something else that um, the cults like to add to their religion. The idea that when we die, we go into some kind of a soul sleep until the day of judgment, and then we'll be awake for the rest of eternity. This is what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. He says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home uh, with the Lord. Once we leave our bodies, we will be with the Lord. And once we are with the Lord, we are going to be perfect. You know, not metaphysically perfect, but morally perfect. We're going to love him with a perfect love. The author to the Hebrews, when he is contrasting Mount Sinai and what took place there with the heavenly Mount Zion and what it's like there, which is heaven, this is what he writes in chapter 12, verses 22 to 23. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, made perfect. We'll be perfect in heaven, which means we're going to be perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit, and we're not going to be struggling with sin any longer. We're just going to have nothing but pure and holy love for God and for the saints and for the angels. That's something that, as believers, we look forward to because sin is the most troubling thing. Sin is, a, is that area in which we lack love for God. It is the opposite of love, and it's something we struggle with because we want to love God with a perfect heart, but we don't yet. There, we will. Now, once we're in heaven, we know the day of judgment will be coming unless, of course, the Lord comes for us uh, on that day when he comes, there, there will be the final judgment. But if he comes for us at death before the final judgment, we'll be perfected spirits in heaven, as we just read. But then there will be the day of judgment when we'll stand before him. And the blessing there is the Lord will acquit us on that day. We will be blameless before him because we're in Jesus Christ Jude writes in, in verse 24, only one chapter in that book, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. He's going to acquit us on that day, but as we were reminded not too long ago, he is going to reward us for the things that we have done. He's not going to hold us accountable for our sins. Those are all taken care of by Jesus. But he will reward us for the things that we have done for him uh, Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 2, verses 6 and 7, that God will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. Now notice they're seeking for glory. It's the glory in heaven. 
They're seeking for honor. That's the honor the Lord is going to give to us in heaven. That's essentially what the rewards are made of, glory, honor, and some conjecture an increased ability to enjoy heaven. Thomas Watson, Jonathan Edwards, like so many vessels, so many pots cast into an ocean of love, each varying in size, every one of them filled to the top, but some having a greater fullness of that joy and pleasure. But certainly there are places of honor in Scripture. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus, Lord, in your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your right and the other one on your left? Jesus didn't say, hey, you got it wrong. Everybody's the same in heaven. There are no places of honor. He said, that isn't for me to give. That's for whom the Father has chosen. Um, but he went on to say, you can drink of my cup, which is the cup of suffering. Okay, so there are places of honor in heaven. We know there are. And it's based upon what we do for the Lord here, which is a part of God's plan for our lives. So he will reward us. And then at the end of the judgment, he will receive us into his kingdom. Jesus will say to the sheep on his right in Matthew 25, 34, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, there we will receive the greatest blessing that there is to receive. And, and the rewards in heaven are certainly a blessing, but the greatest blessing is one we all receive, which is we get to see God. Now, remember we saw this morning something of the Lord's perfections, and we saw that His holiness is what makes Him beautiful. You know, in the Old Testament, when the Lord appears, He expresses that, that perfection and that holiness in a certain kind of uh, luminescence that He emits, the glory cloud, you know, and sometimes that cloud would fill the temple and it was something so heavy that the priests couldn't stand. They had to, to kneel. Uh, and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, this cloud came down that was, uh, again, luminescent. It, it's a, an expression of God's glory and of, of, again, His perfection, of His beauty. It's a glory that we really can't see fully on earth because it's not revealed fully on earth, but something we just get a dim sight of. Um, through the Word and through worship. And it's really what keeps us coming back, you know, for, for these things, to see them. It's what the Lord showed us to begin with that drew us to the Lord Jesus Christ, that beauty, that glory. There we're going to see it in all of its fullness, and that will be the most amazing thing that we will ever experience. It is a, a view so beautiful that we'll never want to take our eyes off of it. And as you've already noted, there we're going to be filled with love and joy to the full as we see God and we are filled with His Holy Spirit. Now, we talked about before how there are degrees of, of uh, punishment in hell. Uh, the Bible also teaches, as we already talked about, degrees of blessedness in heaven. But the other thing was the idea of the whirlpool, you know, in hell always descending. Uh, Jonathan Edwards believed that in heaven will always be ascending because as we view the Lord and as we see His glory and we learn more about Him, our blessedness will continue to increase. So the rewards only determine where we begin, but throughout eternity we'll be like a tornado <laughs> going, going upwards, always, um, always ascending. So it'll get better and better and better. Now Jesus tells us that we need to keep our eyes on that, okay, which is what the devil's trying to obscure us from. Keep our eyes on that which is ahead of us, to keep our eyes on heaven and what we're going to receive in heaven and not on the world. These very familiar words from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So why is it that Satan is continually trying to get us to look downward at the world and to find our happiness here and to try to get as much of the goodies that we can here? Because he knows it will put our hearts 
in the world. He doesn't want our hearts in heaven because when our hearts are in heaven, we become a danger to him. And he wants to be able to continue his agenda without our getting in the way. Now, Satan is very good at what he does, remember. How often do we think about heaven? Are we convinced that that's where our treasure actually is? Or are we more convinced that it's here in this world and we better get it while we can because we're going to be leaving and then we're not going to be able to keep it? Well, that, that tells us just how valuable this treasure actually is. It's something Jesus already told us you can't keep. We're all going to lose it. So the question is, how can we keep our eyes focused on heaven and upon the Lord and His kindnesses and His mercies? Well, let me just leave you with, with three simple things that if you want to learn more about these things, I'd, I'd suggest you read Henry Scudder's book called The Christian's Daily Walk. And it's a book on how to live for the glory of God. And he had, again, these three simple suggestions which will keep our eyes focused above if we practice them. He said... When we get up in the morning, we should think about the day that we will rise from our graves. Every time you wake up in the morning, think of it as a resurrection to that particular day. So get your eyes focused on the Lord early in the morning. When we go to bed at night, think about the time when you're going to lie down for the very last time in this life and whether or not you're ready, whether or not you're prepared to meet Him. And then during the day, do what you need to do to prepare. Be thinking about how what you're doing is affecting or will affect uh, what you can expect on the day when you stand before Him. Is this going to be good? Is this going to be bad? Is this going to be worthless? And then live accordingly. Okay, so don't let the enemy distract you. Keep your eyes on His glory on the Lord's glory, on His beauty. Keep your eyes fixed on His grace and His mercy and let these things motivate you to love Him more and to serve Him more. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply this. We'll do uh, silently at first and then I'll close the time of prayer.